Distinguished guests, excellencies, and friends, welcome to Shin DC's annual congressional commemoration, 2021. We have over 1,000 participants joining us today for what promises to be a meaningful program with very distinguished speakers. We express our gratitude to our annual congressional sponsor, Representative Jamie Raskin, also to the Embassy of Israel and to all of our co-sponsors who are listed on the program. We gather today to remember the victims of the Holocaust and to honor the survivors. The events that occurred 76 to 90 years ago resulted in a destruction of European Jewish life, including Sephardic, Romaniote, and Ashkenazi communities. And more broadly, they showed the extent of challenges to humanity. We are forever grateful to those who were at the forefront of fighting the evil for the benefit of humanity back then, the righteous, and all those who helped save Jews, including the refugees of the Holocaust. Today, there are other unique challenges to humanity, notably the pandemic. In this context, I would like to introduce our special guest speaker, Dr. Albert Burla. As chairman and chief executive officer of Pfizer, Dr. Burla leads the company to deliver breakthroughs that change patients' lives through scientific and commercial innovation. As we all know, Pfizer has been a major force for transforming human health by developing, along with BioNTech, the world's first widely authorized COVID-19 vaccine. Dr. Burla is on the executive committee of the Partnership for New York City, a vice president of the IFPMA, a trustee of the U.S. Council for International Business, and a director on multiple boards, including Pfizer, the Pfizer Foundation, Pharma, and Catalyst. Dr. Burla is a doctor of veterinary medicine with a PhD from the Veterinary School of Aristotle University in his hometown of Thessaloniki, Greece. And it's his roots in Thessaloniki's Sephardic Jewish community that have led him to speak to us today to honor the blessed memory of his parents, Mois and Sara Burla, residents of Thessaloniki who were among the few there to survive the Holocaust. Dr. Burla, thank you for joining us. It is very inspiring that the children of Shoah survivors are now on the front line of fighting today's plague. Your presence here is an honor to us. We look forward to hearing your remarks on this solemn occasion. The floor is yours, Dr. Burla. Thank you, Ephraim, and good afternoon, everyone. It is a great honor for me to be asked to share my family story in connection with this International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Remembrance is a word perhaps more than any other that inspired me to share my parents' story. That's because I recognize how fortunate I am that my parents shared their stories with me and the rest of our family. Many Holocaust survivors never spoke to their children of the horrors they endured because it was too painful. But we talked about it a great deal in my family. Growing up in Thessaloniki, in Greece, we would get together with our cousins on the weekends and my parents, my aunts and my uncles will often share their stories. They did this because they wanted us to remember, to remember all the lives that were lost, to remember what can happen when the virus of evil is allowed to spread unchecked. But most important, to remember the value of a human life. You see, when my parents spoke of the Holocaust, they never spoke of anger or revenge. They didn't teach us to hate those who did this to our family and to our friends. Instead, they spoke of how lucky they were to be alive and how we all needed to build on that feeling, to celebrate life and move forward. Hatred would only stand in the way. So in that spirit, I'm here to share the story of Mois and Sarah Burla, my beloved parents. Our ancestors had fled Spain in the late 15th century after King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella issued the Alabra degree, which mandated that all Spanish Jews either convert to Catholicism or be expelled from the country. They eventually settled in the Ottoman Thessaloniki, which later became part of Greece following its liberation in 1912. Before Hitler began his march through Europe, 
there was a thriving Sephardic Jewish community in Thessaloniki. So much so that it was known as La Madre de Israel or the Mother of Israel. Within a week of the occupation, however, the Nazis had arrested the Jewish leadership, evicted hundreds of Jewish families and confiscated their apartments. And it took them less than three years to accomplish their goal of exterminating the community. When the Germans invaded Greece, there were approximately 50,000 Jews living in the city. By the end of the war, only 2,000 had survived. Lucky for me, both of my parents were among the 2,000. My father's family, like so many others, had been forced from their home and taken to a crowded house within one of the Jewish ghettos. It was a house they had to share with several other Jewish families. They could circulate in and out of the ghetto as long as they were wearing the yellow star. But one day in March of 1943, the ghetto was surrounded by occupational forces and the exit was blocked. My father Moise and his brother Into were outside when this happened. When they approached back, they met their father, who was also outside. He told them what was happening and asked them to leave and hide because he had to go in because his wife and his two other children were home. So later that day, my grandfather, Abraham Burla, his wife, Rachel, his daughter, Graciela, and his younger son, David, were taken to a camp outside the train station. And from then, they left from, for Auschwitz-Birkenau. Mois, my father, and his brother, Into, never saw them again. The same night, my father and uncle escaped to Athens when they were able to obtain fake IDs with Christian names. They got the IDs from the head of police at that time, who was helping Jews escape the persecution of the Nazis. They lived in Athens until the end of the war, all the while having to pretend that they were not Jews, that were not Mois and Pinto, but rather Manolis and Vasilis. When the German occupation ended, they went back to Thessaloniki and found that all their property and belongings have been stolen or sold. With nothing to their name, they started from scratch, becoming partners in a successful liquor business that they ran together until they both retired. My mom's story also was one of having to hide in her own land, of narrowly escaping the horrors of Auschwitz, and of family bonds that sustained her spirit and quite literally saved her life. Like my father's family, my mom's family was relocated to a house within the ghetto. My mother was the youngest girl of seven children. Her older sister had converted to Christianity to marry a Christian man she fell in love with. That happened before the war. And she and her husband were living in another city where no one knew that she had previously been a Jew. At that time, mixed weddings were not accepted by society. And my grandfather wouldn't talk to his eldest daughter because of this and after she did that. By when it became clear that the family was going to head to Poland, when the Germans had promised a new life in a Jewish settlement, my grandfather asked his eldest daughter to come and see him. In this last meeting they ever had, he asked her to take her younger sister, my mom, Sarah, with her. He thought that there my mom would be safe because no one knew that she or her sister were of Jewish heritage. The rest of the family, they went by train straight to auschwitz birkenau Toward the end of the war, my mom's brother-in-law was transferred back to Thessaloniki. People knew my mom there 
So she had to hide in the house 24 hours a day out of fear of being recognized and turned over to the Germans. But she was still a teenager. And every so and often, she would venture outside. And unfortunately, during one of those walks, she was spotted and arrested. She was sent to a local prison. It was not good news. It was well known that every day around noon, many of the prisoners would be loaded on a truck to be transferred to another location where the next dawn they would be executed. Knowing this, her brother-in-law, my dearest Christian uncle, Costas Dimadis, approached Max Merton, a known war criminal who was in charge of the Nazi occupation forces in the city. He paid Merton and ransom in exchange for his promise that my mom would be spared, would not be executed. But her sister, my aunt, didn't trust the Germans and their work. So she would go to the prison every day at noon to watch as they loaded the truck that would transfer the prisoners to the execution site, hoping that my mother would not be among them. And one day she saw what she had been afraid of, my mom being put on the truck. She ran home and told her husband, who immediately called Merton. He reminded him of their agreement and tried to shame him for not keeping his word. Merton said he would look into it and then abruptly hang up the phone. That night was the longest in my aunt and uncle's life because they knew the next morning my mom would likely be executed. The next day, on the other side of our town, my mom was lined up against a wall with other prisoners, my teenage mom. And moments before she would have been executed, a soldier, a German soldier on a BMW motorcycle arrived and handed some papers to the men in charge of the firing squad. They removed from the line my mom and another woman. As they rode away, my mom could hear the machine gun fire slaughtering those that were left behind. It's a sound that stayed with her for the rest of her life. Two or three days later, she was released from prison. And just a few weeks after that, the Germans left Greece. Fast forward eight years and my parents were introduced by their families in a typical, for the time, matchmaking. They liked each other and agreed to marry. They had two children, me and my sister, Sally. My father had two dreams for me. He wanted me to become a scientist and he was hoping that I would marry a nice Jewish girl. I'm happy to say that he lived long enough to see both dreams come true. Unfortunately, he died before our children were born. But my life, but my mom did live long enough to see them, which was the greatest of blessings. So that is the story of Mois and Sarah Burda. It's a story that had a great impact on my life and my view of the world. And it is a story that for the first time today, I share publicly. However, when I received the invitation to speak at this event, at this moment of time, when racism and hatred are, treating, are tearing at the fabric of our great nation, I felt it was the right time to share the story of two simple people who loved each other, loved the others, they were loved by the others, and they loved their family and friends. Two people who set down hatred and build a life filled with love and joy. Two people whose names are known by very few, 
but whose story has now been shared with the members of the United States, States Congress, the world's greatest and most just legislative body. And that makes their son very, very proud. That, that brings me back to remembrance. As time marches on and today's event shrinks in our rear view mirrors, I wouldn't expect you to remember my parents' names, but I implore you to remember their story because remembering give each of us the conviction, the courage and the compassion to take the necessary actions to ensure their story is never repeated. Thank you again for the invitation to speak today and thank you for remembering. Stay safe and stay well. Dr. Burla, thank you for telling your family story and for your inspiring words receive your words as also being in honor of all those others who made it through and of those who perished during those horrible years. We are very proud of your contribution to the world today and the fact that it is the son of Holocaust survivors who is making this contribution is very meaningful to all of us who are gathered here today. We will now receive remarks from the event's congressional sponsor, Representative Jamie Raskin. Hello, my dear friends. It's Congressman Jamie Raskin from Maryland's 8th Congressional District. Welcome everyone to this year's Congressional Holocaust Commemoration with Sephardic Heritage International. It's such an honor to be the Congressional sponsor for this um, observance of International Holocaust Remembrance Day. I'm sorry we can't gather together in person this year, but I'm very grateful that we're able to do it virtually. And I thank you all for coming and participating as we mark the 76th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz we remember the millions of victims of the Holocaust and reaffirm our commitment to protect democracy and human rights and the dignity of every individual in the face of rising racism, authoritarianism, and fascism. The theme for this year's commemoration is refugees of the Holocaust, looking at experiences of diverse Jewish refugees in Portugal, the Balkans, North Africa, the Middle East, and East Asia, as well as the factors affecting their disparate searches for refuge. With this theme in mind, we must defend Jewish communities across the world and at home who continue uh, to face the forces of anti-Semitism, racism, fascism, and violence. Remembering this history is solemn, but it is uh, a profound duty that all of us have so that we can honor our vow never again to allow such atrocities uh, to occur to the Jewish people or to anyone else. Thank you for inviting me to join you again this year, and I look forward to when we can observe this day in person and thank you all for your continuing devotion to protecting human rights. Many thanks to Congressman Raskin. We also extend heartfelt condolences to him and his family on the terribly sad news of the loss of his beloved son, Tommy Raskin. May his memory be for a blessing. We will now receive remarks from Representative Gregory Meeks, the Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Good afternoon. I'm Congressman Gregory Meeks, Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and I'm honored to speak to you today on this most solemn occasion. First, let me thank Franz Afrahim Katzer for the kind invitation. And I wanna thank you all for the important work you do to raise awareness of the Sephardic heritage. On this day, the 76th anniversary of the liberation of Nazi camps, concentration camps and the end of the Holocaust, we solemnly observe and remember. We pause to remember and honor the victims of the Holocaust, a truly unparalleled crime against humanity. We collectively mourn the loss of so many. We all have a moral obligation to remember that the Holocaust was a systematic attempt to eliminate the Jewish people based on a concerted campaign of hate and genocide. Joining you here today with this year's theme of Refugees of the Holocaust, I'm reminded of our past as a nation, of our founding as a nation of immigrants and refugees, but also of our failings. I'm reminded of the SS St. Louis 
the ship of Jewish refugees fleeing Nazi advances in Europe that was cruelly turned away from American shores in 1939. Tragically, the ship was eventually forced to return to Europe and many of its passengers were killed at the hands of Nazis. And at other times, our country has served as a beacon of hope for those fleeing persecution, such as those escaping the repressive Soviet state and the destruction of the Vietnam War and the bitter conflict of the Balkans. Now again, we have the opportunity and moral obligation to reverse anti-refugee policies and again seek to open our doors to those seeking refuge from persecution and strife. Unfortunately, and indeed shamefully, xenophobia and anti-Semitism are both very well alive today. We've seen it in recent years. We've seen a rise in hate crimes, violent acts of hatred toward Jewish communities in the United States and Europe, fueled by demagoguery and vitriol. We've seen this hate speech fuel violent acts of hate against our communities and our neighbors, black, Jewish, and immigrant. We've seen it from Charlottesville to Pittsburgh Tree of Life Synagogue to anti-Semitic attacks in Brooklyn last spring, to earlier this month in our own capital, where racist and anti-Semitic slogans could be heard like battle cries. Such acts of hate cannot be ignored, cannot be tolerated, and must be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And I am concerned. But yet I remain hopeful. Just last week, President Biden declared on those same steps nearly overrun by violent insurrectionists that we can deliver justice and we can once again make America the leading force for good in the world. Already he has reversed the Muslim ban, pledged to increase refugee admissions, and committed to investigating and prosecuting hate crimes and domestic extremists. As chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, I commit to ensuring our nation is once again a beacon of light in the world and recommit to combating the vicious scourge of anti-Semitism. We are a nation of immigrants. And America is stronger when we welcome refugees and embrace all communities and people who make our nation strong. So today, as we remember and honor the millions who lost their lives in the Holocaust and pay tribute to those who survived, we pledge never to forget, but also never to end the fight against anti-Semitism and xenophobia. Thank you. Many thanks to Chairman Meeks for his remarks. We now turn to Her Excellency Alexandra Papadopoulou, Ambassador of Greece to the United States, whom we are honored to count as a friend of Shin DC, actively participating in multiple programs. The Greek-Jewish relationship is very valuable to us, and we appreciate the important role of Greek Jews as that relationship grows further over time. Ambassador Papadopoulou, over to you. Thank you very much. It is indeed an honor to be invited to speak today in this event. Today is a day of sober commemoration as we honor the millions of Jews that were murdered or suffered horrific acts during one of the darkest times in our history leaving an indelible stain on humanity. This is also a day when we hold ourselves accountable and renew our commitment to never forget. This is the day when we should all commit that we will take every action that these evil forces will not rear their ugly heads ever again, that we will react, we will not turn our heads away at the first signs of the monster 
and that we will never, never stay silent again. Greece has been home to Europe's oldest Jewish communities who have lived in Greece for over 2,000 years. Our city of Thessaloniki was the Jewish diaspora's most important city for over five centuries. It is also a city that bore the brand of the Holocaust very, very hard. So for my country, it is a more obligation to the memory of those who were perished during the Nazi occupation and also to the memory of all those uh, who took risks to protect uh, the lives uh, of their fellow Jewish human beings, uh, to take a strong stance against antisemitism, adopting the working definition of antisemitism as formed by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, whose chairmanship is going to be taken over by Greece next month. Uh, also for a country, it's an, all, an obligation to adopt the working definition of Holocaust denial and distortion as we did among the first countries who did so and take concrete actions uh, so that hard measures are in place uh, in order to punish those who denied the Holocaust uh, and also educate the population and the younger generation about the horrors of what happened. And despite the fact that the majority of our Jewish compatriots in Greece lost their lives to the evil instincts of Nazism, the Greek Jewish community retains its dynamic presence, thriving and greatly contributing to Greece and to the world, an integral part of Greek society, as so aptly exemplified by today's keynote speaker, Mr. Albert Burla. Thank you so much, very much for inviting me to speak. Thank you so much, Ambassador Papadopoulou, for your most fitting remarks. The Holocaust was a global tragedy. Different countries were affected and the righteous people in different countries distinguished themselves in various ways. In Albania, the number of Jews was greater after World War II than before. We are now honored to have some remarks from Her Excellency Florida Faber, Ambassador of Albania to the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aferim. Dear colleague ambassadors, Dear Mrs. Daniels, Dr. Burola, dear organizers, so many participants. I am privileged and honored to be here today and be part of this annual Congressional Holocaust Memorial. During the last several years now, I have been part of many events where proudly representing Albanian people, the very common Albanians who saved lives of every single Jew who lived in Albania during the World War II. Albanians have played a crucial role during difficult times for Jewish people because every member of the Jewish community residing within Albanian borders survived during the Holocaust. The stories of Jews during the World War II were silent for a few decades. The story of Albanians who saved Jews was one of them unknown to the world and unknown to many of us as Albanians. In many rooms I have entered and auditoriums I have addressed as I was ambassador of Albania here in the United States, I was the first to tell the audience that there was not a single known case of Jews being turned over to Nazi authorities in Albania during the Nazi occupation. I was the first to voice that Albania was the only country in the world that had 10 times more Jews after the war than before the World War II started. It is for this reason that today I am particularly thankful to the organizers for putting together events like this where we gather to commemorate the particular moment in history and speak with the hope that values that we have learned from the past will triumph we teach the new generation respect for human rights, all inclusiveness and respect for other ethnics and religious groups. All this should lie in the foundation of our societies as to ensure that future generations make the same, do not make the same mistakes again. In the world where we live today, we should not stand and witness intolerance. During the pandemic, we have witnessed extremism, anti-Semitism and other forces of forms of racism, we should not tolerate and should not and should take necessary steps 
to prevent any ism to flourish in the future. We see actions of anti-Semitism across the world and as the Prime Minister of Albania emphasized in one of his speeches, speaking to a Balkan summit of anti-Semitism, I quote, we need to continue and fight any form of anti-Semitism which is a threat to our civilization upon which our common future is being built. Albania remains a strong advocate for combating anti-Semitism and has taken actions and real commitments. In a very difficult year like 2020, the Albanian parliament adopted ERA definition, which was a strong step toward combating anti-Semitism. Adopting the ERA definition is a powerful statement of tolerance and respect that there is no place for bigotry and racism. We hope that this important step which Albania has embarked on will be followed by other countries. And we felt that as a start, a strong effort must be made to build a united front among the Balkans to act collectively against any form of anti-Semitism. In this regard, in October last year, the Albanian parliament organized the first ever Balkans forums against anti-Semitism with a high level of participation, including former Secretary of State. It was a great momentum and a historic gathering on this issue, and we are living as we are living in unprecedented times. The stories of the past should help us build for a better future. The stories should be told, and events like this of today should be often held. I conclude by thanking the organizers for putting this wonderful to get event together. Thank you for bringing the voice of Albania and making it a very active part of it. And I wish you good luck for the rest of the program. Thank you, Ambassador Faber, for your inspiring words. Portugal, part of Sepharad, the Hebrew name of Iberia, is home to a historical Jewish community. Even after the expulsion, Portuguese Jews have continued feeling much connection and affinity to Portugal. And recently, Portugal offered nationality to the descendants of Portuguese Jews, a very meaningful gesture of historic reconciliation that is re-energizing Jewish life there. During World War II, neutral Portugal was a key port where Jews found refuge and through which they could escape to America and elsewhere. Aristides de Souza Mendes, a Portuguese diplomat who was in Paris, sacrificed his own career and well-being to save Jews because of his efforts in opening up a refugee escape route De Souza Mendes has been honored as one of the righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem. Today, Aristides de Souza Mendes is also recognized as one of Portugal's chief national heroes, for which we are very grateful. We will now receive remarks from His Excellency Domingos Fezas Vital, Ambassador of Portugal to the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I want to start by thanking you for your kind invitation. It is a honor for me to address you on this occasion, especially as Portugal is holding this semester the presidency of the Council of the European Union. Human rights in general have always been at the core of the EU's foreign policy, and among these the fight against anti-Semitism will always be paramount. We are 70 years away from the most egregious horrors committed during the Second World War and indeed the years preceding it, against the Jewish people and also other minorities. If anything, it has become more necessary than ever to remember the Holocaust and to honor those who survived and those who died. Why? Because memories are fading and with it comes the risk of some sort of relativism that unfortunately has been surfacing here and there in Europe. Because less and less of those who lived firsthand the unimaginable atrocities of the ghettos and the gas chambers are still among us. Because the youth has to be taught to ensure that nothing like it can occur ever again. The Holocaust has been the greatest atrocity in history. That is why Portugal stands proudly among other nations who join the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. We honor the memory of Aristides de Sousa Mendes, the first diplomat to be recognized as righteous among the nations by the State of Israel. 
and others less well-known figures, such as the Catholic priest Joaquin Carrera or the private citizen José Brito Mendes. They all helped Jews escape the Nazi clutches during the Second World War. It is only fair to acknowledge our own past. It makes no sense to point at the splinter in the eyes of others if we don't remove the log in our own eyes. In the 16th century, the Portuguese king, egged on by bigotry and misguided notions of unity, expelled Jewish communities that were living since time immemorial back from the days of the Roman Empire in the territory that became Portugal. This was a tragedy, first and foremost for those who were expelled, or were skilled, of course, but it was also a long-term tragedy for the kingdom itself, as it lost valuable subjects that emigrated to other countries. Indeed, at the time of the global discoveries, they reinforced our competitors, who greatly benefited from the brain drain that unwittingly we ourselves had produced. I would exhaust my time if I were to list all the famous individuals of Portuguese Sephardic origin that went on to make a name for themselves. Today, I would like to remember the philosopher Spinoza, because as the Bible, a precious gift to the world of Jewish culture says, do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. That is why, as you all know very well, my country has in place a nationality acquisition scheme for descendants of Sephardic Jews, whose ancestry can be traced back to Portugal. We encourage those entitled and willing to apply to liaise with the Jewish communities in Lisbon and Oporto, who will guide you in the process. Allow me a brief final word concerning the present. Portugal has undergone tremendous changes in past decades. It has now an educated English-speaking workforce, enjoys first-class healthcare, promotes innovation and connectedness in the digital world, especially among the young. This all happens while we can, please excuse my immodesty, boast about our warm hospitality, our superb climate and our natural, wall and tasty food which, as every January month in Washington reminds us, is also nice. That is why, if you haven't done so, I want to invite you all to visit Portugal when conditions so permit. To enjoy as a tourist, to appreciate our heritage, including restored Jewish sites, such as the ones we can find in Belmont, Castel de Vid, or Monsanto, but also to study or to start a business. The place that is, for some of you, the home of your forefathers is ready to welcome you all with our arms wide open. Thank you very much. Many thanks to Ambassador Domingos Vesas Vital for his remarks and congratulations to Portugal for embarking on the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union. As the Jewish world yearns for a better and lasting peace in the Middle East, the recent actions by Morocco are an immense and very valued contribution to building peace for everyone, a step that has special significance when we reflect on the consequences of intolerance. We forever remain grateful to Morocco's King Mohammed V, whose righteous actions stopped the Nazis short of eradicating the kingdom's large Sephardic Jewish community, even allowing others to find refuge there, including a young boy from France named Isaac O'Grabli of blessed memory. We are also thankful to His Majesty King Mohammed VI for leading by example and upholding the proud heritage of tolerance perpetuated by his forefathers. We will now receive remarks from Her Highness Lala Jumala Alawi, Ambassador of Morocco to the United States. Honorable Congressman, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank Representative Raskin and Mr. Katzer, Director of Sephardic Heritage International DC, for their leadership in organizing this third edition of the Congressional Holocaust Commemoration. I am truly humbled to be part of this event as we pause to remember the victims of the Holocaust. We are also here to honor the fortunate ones who managed to pull through this tragic ordeal and to hear their voices. Their stories never cease to inspire courage, awe, and admiration. As our humanity went through one of its darkest hours, 
glimmers of light emerged around the Mediterranean, in North Africa and beyond, as some brave individuals stood up in defiance of evil by seeking to protect the persecuted or provide refuge to those forced to flee. As you may know, my country, Morocco, has a unique history with the Jewish people. Successive waves of Jewish refugees found shelter in Morocco as far back as two millennia, following the destruction of the Temple of Solomon, the fall of Andalusia in 1492, or during World War II. They formed a vibrant Jewish community that became an integral part of the kingdom's society and culture, as highlighted in our Constitution, which enshrines the importance of the Hebraic influence to Morocco's identity. During World War II, when Morocco was under French protectorate, my late grandfather, His Majesty King Mohammed V, stood up to protect 250,000 Moroccan Jews by refusing to comply with the race laws of the pro-Nazi Vichy government. He famously replied, there are no Jews in Morocco, they are only Moroccan subjects. The lives and properties of Moroccan Jews were thus kept under his protection and this bold action prompted many to seek safe haven in Morocco during the remainder of the war. Ladies and gentlemen, stories of victims and survivors must be amplified and carried forward so that future generations never forget this horrific chapter of our history. Only through education can we prevent the errors of the past from recurring. It is in this spirit that Morocco recently became the first country in the Arab world to add Jewish history to its national school curriculum alongside many other efforts spearheaded by His Majesty the King to promote, protect and rehabilitate Jewish heritage. Such efforts include the maintenance of Jewish cemeteries and rebuilding historic Jewish neighborhoods. Furthermore, His Majesty King Mohammed VI has forcefully rejected Holocaust when he declared, and I quote, that anti-Semitism is the antithesis of freedom of expression. It implies a denial of the other and is an admission of failure, inadequacy, and an inability to coexist. The fact that we still need to fight against Holocaust denial is a sobering reminder that much more needs to be done and that we should never be complacent, particularly in reaction to rising extremism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia. Intolerance against people based on ethnic origin or religion should have no place in our world today, or even, again, as we seek to make this reality, we all are required to never forget and to work collectively to ensure that no one else does. You can always count on Morocco to do its part in building a future of peaceful coexistence. Thank you very much. Many thanks to Her Highness Ambassador Lala Jumal al Alawi. We are most grateful to Morocco for its firm commitment to Holocaust education and to combating anti-Semitism and all forms of hatred. We will now have the musical commemoration component of our program performed by world-renowned pianist Reynan Cohen, a member of the Jewish community in Turkey. I should note that Turkish diplomats such as Selahattin Ülkümen, who was recognized as righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem, rescued a number of Jews during the war, including French and Rhodesli Jews who were Turkish citizens. Renan is going to play Arvoles Yoran por Luvia, which in Ladino or Judeo-Spanish means trees cry for rain. And while she plays, let's take a moment to reflect on all those who perished during the Holocaust, as well as the survivors who are no longer with us. 
I now give the floor to Renan Cohen, who is joining us from Istanbul. So I would like to play as a prime perfectly set Arbolens for Lugia, because I chose this song because this song sang by Jews from Thessaloniki in Auschwitz Birkenau. So it says, trees cry for the rain, and I cry for your eyes, my love. So I would like to play for all the victims perished, who perished and who suffered in Holocaust. And I wish never again, no more discrimination, no more hate, no more xenophobia for everybody in the world. Thank you so much, Renan. Thank you so much, Ephraim. It's very meaningful for me to be here. Right? Thank you for that moving musical commemoration for all those who perished in the Holocaust and for all the survivors who are no longer with us. We also note that Sephardic survivor Flory Jagoda sang Alvarez Yoran Porluvia, 
when a new memorial tablet in Ladino was unveiled at Auschwitz-Birkenau in 2003. I'm Alan Makovsky, a member of the board of Shin DC, and it's my great privilege to introduce the State Department's Special Envoy for Holocaust Issues, Ms. Cherry Daniels. Special Envoy Daniels is a career diplomat who has had a number of interesting and important assignments over the years, including in Jerusalem, uh, before she began her current critical work. She speaks several languages, including Hebrew. Madam Special Envoy, uh, it's an honor to have you with us here uh, on this occasion. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Alan uh, Makovsky, for that uh, kind introduction, and uh, thank you to the hosts and co-hosts, Chairman Meeks, Representative Raskin, uh, Shin DC, and, uh, and the distinguished uh, excellencies and guests uh, who, who you have on today's program. I'm so honored to be included in, in, in such a group. Uh, I wish we could share this kind of commemoration in person. I think that would be so meaningful to me rather than doing it virtually, but I'm so grateful that you did uh, allow it to go forward as a virtual one this year, and perhaps the time to come together uh, will come next year. I particularly welcome the commemoration's focus on refugees and the plight of European Jewish refugees, whether in North Africa or in Europe and across the Balkans and Iberian Peninsula during World War II. It's a chapter of the Holocaust that is not often enough highlighted specifically in the annual Holocaust commemorations. As the Department of State Special Envoy for Holocaust Issues, I'm committed to promoting historically accurate Holocaust commemoration and education and research and archive opening around the world. And I think uh, today's event greatly advances that, those goals. At a time where we, uh, many have commented that we're facing growing Holocaust distortion and denial, but promotion, uh, mainly distortion and conspiracy theories uh, about the Holocaust, the mission that you have is more important than ever, promoting historically accurate commemoration and memory and telling the stories as Dr. Borla did, of uh, uh, putting those stories forward uh, firsthand so that we can learn what happened. About 450,000 to 500,000 Jews called Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya home at the beginning of World War II. And they were joined years before that by thousands, uh, uh, sorry, after the war, they were joined by thousands of European Jews who fled there uh, in the face of Nazi persecution in Europe. The Jews in the region of, uh, that we're discussing today ended up sharing a common history of suffering and persecution at the hands of Nazi authorities or the French Vichy government or the Italian fascist collaborators and others uh, who governed in, uh, in those countries during part of the war. And their experience, their suffering from North Africa uh, and from the Balkan and Iberian Peninsula need to be understood, remembered, honored, shared as you're doing. The history that we're looking at is a complex one and I believe it's incredibly useful to have heard from the ambassadors who have already spoken as to what happened in their countries and the history, the complex history. It's also a history sprinkled with unheralded acts of heroism resilience and kindness by Jews and non-Jews alike. We all may be familiar with the heroic actions taken by the Portuguese Consul General in Bordeaux, Adesusa Mendes, who the Portuguese ambassador very greatly just mentioned, who defied the instructions of his superiors and provided transit visas into Portugal for tens of thousands of Jews who were fleeing Nazi persecution. However, I doubt uh, enough Americans know about the transit camp near Casablanca that hosted Jewish refugees on their way to the Americas. And I was pleased that I was able to visit Morocco in an earlier assignment. I also doubt that many know of the actions taken by Sephardic Jewish community members in Tangiers to welcome and assimilate the mass of Eastern European Jewish refugees who sought refuge on its shores. There are many other such uh, stories that I think it's important to, uh, to carry forward for those who do not know enough about the history of uh, what happened during World War II in this region. It's pertinent for our own times. The focus of today's event on refugees is pertinent for all of us today because Jewish refugees in World War II have much in common with refugees today fleeing uh, every kind of war and, and, and persecution, whether in Syria, whether it's the Rohingya uh, fleeing oppression and violence in Burma, uh, whether it's Uyghurs seeking to avoid internment in Chinese camps in Xinjiang. The fact of the matter is that too many in the international community, including to some extent in our own country, as Chairman Meeks men mentioned, largely failed the Jewish people in its time of need during the Holocaust. He mentioned, for example, the, the St. Louis ship that was turned back, and there are many other such examples. 
We need to ask ourselves whether the same international community is failing to learn and apply the lessons of the Holocaust and whether we're doing enough to educate our own citizens here in this country about the dangers of where unchecked anti-Semitism and other forms of racial hatred can lead. I was pleased in that respect that the Congress uh, in uh, May or June of last year passed the Never Again Education Act, uh, providing funding through the US Holocaust Memorial Museum for $2 million a year over the next five years to increase education in our own country. I believe the history of European Jewish refugees in North Africa and the Middle East during World War II can play a, a role in tearing down the walls of denial about the Holocaust of distortion that persists today in some parts of the Muslim world and in some segments of Muslim communities here in the West. Everyone should know about the acts of heroism uh, and, and the righteous uh, among the nations that were mentioned today. And everyone should know uh, of the other experiences when that was not the case and people did turn in the Jewish communities to the Nazis in other cases. It needs to be specific. One cannot generalize. One must be specific to, to each of the communities. And that sort of acknowledging of the past uh, uh, forthrightly with open eyes and, and not uh, turning away from that past is the only way to learn and bring forward for the future generations the lessons that were, that were uh, brought forward out of the Holocaust. I'd like to conclude by, uh, by thanking you again for the opportunity to be part of the program and perhaps quoting uh, maybe what was not uh, yet fully uh, distributed in case people had missed President Biden's uh, statement on the Holocaust Remembrance Day yesterday when he said, uh, the Holocaust was no accident of history. It occurred because too many governments cold-bloodedly adopted and implemented hate-fueled laws, policies, and practices to vilify and dehumanize entire groups of people. And too many individuals, he said, stood by silently. Silence is complicity, the president said. And he went on to say, as my late friend and Holocaust survivor, Tom Lantos, so frequently reminded us, the veneer of civilization is paper thin. We are its guardians and we can never rest. With that, I'd like to turn the program back over and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you so much, Special Envoy Sherry Daniels, for your remarks. And that concludes our program for today. As we observe International Holocaust Remembrance Day, it is so important to remember that countries and Jewish communities around the world were affected by the Holocaust. And it is so important to remember and transmit all of our stories and memories, including the memories that people have from their families of those experiences. Thanks again to Dr. Albert Burla and to all of our distinguished and excellent speakers for their significant words of remembrance. Thanks again to the Embassy of Israel in Washington, D.C., and also to all of our co-sponsors. Each program that Sephardic Heritage International, or SHIN, does is something to build on, and we hope to see all of you again for other upcoming events. We also look forward to having our next Congressional Holocaust Commemoration, Please God, in person for 2022. Stay safe and stay well. Thank you, everyone.